Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's Sunday night, March 17th, 2024. My name is Glenn Rawson. Welcome to our devotional. Now, before I begin tonight, I wanted to show you a couple of things. A couple of days ago, I was down in Kanab, Utah, and I spoke to the combined SUP and DUP down there, and we had a wonderful evening together talking about the handcart rescue of 1856. The next day, I went to visit some friends, and I, I've got to show you this. I'm, I'm quite proud of it. Brother Chamberlain carved this, and he, he is a master carver, and he carved this along with several other uh, pioneer and Western pieces, and he gave me this. And I'm going to, and I love horses. It's going to be mounted on the front dash of my bunkhouse um, as my escort, as it were. And then the other thing I did, I went and spent some time with Russ and Julie Rogers. And Julie is a premium artist. Oh, she is so good. She gave me this. And, well, yeah, that's just my world right there. She also gave me this one, and I'm not sure I can get this one entirely in the frame, but again, uh, I'm trying to get it so it doesn't glare. There we go. Yep. Oh, she is such a good artist, and she paints so many things uh, related to our pioneer history. So anyway, I had a fun week down with them in, uh, in Kanab and Glendale in that area. Uh, tonight, uh, first of all, well, let me say this. Thank you to all of you who have shared these stories uh, and have signed up to receive them as a free weekly gift and have shared them with someone else. And also, very much so, thank you to all those of you who have signed up to, VIP, to be VIPs. That has helped us tremendously uh, to uh, continue to do the research for these stories and get them out there. So thank you. Now, as I mentioned to you a few days ago, I think in the last fireside, with the church's acquisition of properties in Kirtland and Nauvoo, we were flooded at Fun for Less Tours. We were flooded with phone calls of people wanting to know if we were going to do something. So Jim and Anita and I and the others, we put together a tour now, we're still working out some of the details, but we put together a tour that will be seven days and six nights, and it's kind of like a return to Kirtland tour. We're going to go back and see and spend time in those sites that we don't usually get to spend much time at, particularly the Kirtland Temple. Now, you understand, I'll be leading the tour, but those sites will be under the control and the management and the teaching of the missionaries that are there. But we'll take you there where they can tell you the whole story. And I'll be able to stand outside on the lawn with you and take the time to tell the story in its entirety of the Kirtland Temple and the miracles that happened there. And the same thing in Nauvoo, the red brick store, the, the, the mansion house, the homestead and all of the, and the Nauvoo House, the great hotel, all of these properties have fascinating stories. And we'll have seven days. Normally, we get maybe a half a day in each of these sites if we get that at all. And now we're going to have two to three days to spend time learning the stories of these sites that we never could before. If you're interested in that tour, and again, we're still working out the details, and I think it's going to fill up quickly. It's going to be a small tour, one bus. If you're interested, call this number. This is Fun for Less Tours in Draper. Call this number, 801-619-1022. They'll help you if you're interested. I'm going. I'm going to go. I'd like you to come. All right, tonight... Would you please have a prayer in your heart for me and for each other? Because tonight's subject, well, is touchy. It's a little delicate, and it might offend some people's sensibilities just a bit. So here we go. First story. This first story is a true story, but it never actually happened. That's because it's a parable told by the Savior. He spoke of two men praying in the temple. And one of these men in that parable has become my unspoken hero. 
I am trying, <laughs> albeit unsuccessfully, to be like this one man. Okay, so here's the parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee. He is devoutly religious. He works with great diligence to be strictly obedient to all the commandments of God. Does this sound familiar? He is greatly respected and admired by the people around him, kind of like the main man in the ward, as it were. And he's a good man. He's trying hard. He is so, he, this man is so faithful that he is generous with his tithing, paying more than is asked. And he doesn't just fast once a month. He fasts twice a week, far more than is required. This is a man, for all intents and purposes, that you would say is very active in the church. Now, the other fellow, well, it seems that he has been less than honest in the past. He is despised by those around him. They don't like him. He is dishonored, judged harshly, and he's even outright rejected by most of the people who know him. By some, he is considered to be a traitor to his country. And there seems to be evidence that up to this point in the man's life, he cared little about God and what God's commandments were. So which of these two men is my hero? The second one. Why? Well, I once heard it said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Which of these two then is its do I want to focus your attention on? Listen to the prayers of both men as they went to the temple to pray. The first man, the Pharisee, the man active in his ward, as it were, he prayed like this, quote, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, I fast twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. Luke chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. This first fellow, the very righteous one, sounds pretty sure of himself. Now, the second man. The second man was a Jewish publican, which is kind of like an ancient version of the IRS, Jewish citizens who worked for Rome taxing their own people. This publican feels so unworthy that as he approaches the temple to prayer, he pounds on his chest. He won't even lift up his eyes toward heaven, and he won't even stand near the devoutly respected religious Pharisee. And the second man prays simply, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. To this man's prayer, the publican, the Savior responded shockingly, quote, I tell you, this man, meaning the, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? The publican, no matter what his past has been, his present is humble and repentant, not arrogant, not self-righteous. Thus, he is right with God, and at any cost, that's what I want to be. My friends, do you see the power of this parable? For all of our righteousness and all of our activity and recommends and all this other stuff, if we're harsh, unkind, judgmental, we cancel it all out. Second story. This story is about the things that actually define us. Who are you? And if you could point to one thing to say this defines me as a person, what would it be? Go back to August 13, 1856 in Florence, Nebraska. 
The Willie Hancock Company faced a very difficult decision. Should they push on to the Salt Lake Valley, another 1,031 miles ahead of them, or should they stay there and try to survive winter over on the Missouri River? That meeting was high drama because there was so much at stake. And, and many of the leaders pushed the saints to go. Levi Savage stood up. He was one of the sub-captains, one of the leaders. He stood up and it is recorded that he said the following. Levi was invited to speak. Let me back up. Levi was invited to speak in the meeting by Captain Willie. And Levi said, I said to him that if I spoke, I must speak my mind, let it cut where it would. Captain Willie said, certainly, do so. And then Levi said, I then related to the saints the hardships we should have to endure. I said that we were liable to have to wade in snow up to our knees and should at night wrap ourselves in a thin blanket and lie on the frozen ground without a bed. I spoke warmly upon the subject, but spoke truth, and the people, judging from appearance and after expressions, felt the force of it. End of quote. George Cunningham was in that meeting, and he recorded that as Levi spoke, the tears commenced to flow down his cheeks, and he prophesied that if we undertook the journey at that late season of the year, that their bones would strew the way, he said. That counsel from Levi Savage was in direct opposition to what the other leaders were telling the saints to, the do, to do. They went on the offensive. The other leaders went on the offensive against Levi and questioned not only Levi's loyalty, but also his faith, accusing him of having no faith. And in the end, in the end, some of the company did stay on the Missouri River, but the majority voted to follow their leaders and went on towards the Salt Lake Valley and into disaster. Now, fast forward to October 19, 1856. The Willie Company had reached the fifth crossing of the Sweetwater River west of Devil's Gate in Wyoming. The last ration of flour was issued. There was nothing left to sustain the camp and they were still 300 miles from Salt Lake City and any civilization. They still had another 56 miles to go to what was reported to be a resupply station at South Pass. 56 miles, no food, winter. It was noon. The company stopped to rest and it started to snow. Now, could their situation have been any more bleak? Out of food malnourished, starved to the point of death, without adequate clothing, shelter, on one of the most exposed portions of the entire trail, and still more than 250 miles plus for civilization. Hang on. And now it begins to snow hard and it's cold and it's, the snow is wind driven with sand in it. And just then four riders rode into their camp with news that rescue wagons were just up ahead that had come out from the Salt Lake Valley. They were only a day or two ahead. Get up, keep going, move on towards the wagon. Well, the Willie Company indeed did get back up and they struggled on all the way to Sixth Crossing while the rescue riders continued on and went east looking for the Martin Company. Well, the Willie Company camped that night on the Sweetwater, and it took until nearly 10 o'clock that night, October 19th, to get everyone finally into the camp. It was a long hike, cold and snowy. The next morning, the next morning, the weather was bitterly cold and the camp was out of food. Where were those rescue wagons? The urgency. The decision was made by Captain James G. Willie that he would take Joseph B. Elder and go on in search of those rescue wagons. So Elder and Willie rode to the base of Rocky Ridge, 10 to 12 miles. The wagons were not there. So they went on up over the trail, up over Rocky Ridge, another 14 miles. 
still no wagons. And all of this in the face of a snow, in the face of snow, a blizzard, and an awful cold wind. Finally, just at nightfall, by the miracle of a well-placed sign by Harvey Clough, they found the rescue company. The next morning, the rescuers hitched up, went hard for the Willie Company, reaching them just at sunset. Mary Hearn said it best. They came just in time to save our lives. Of Captain Willie, George Cunningham said, our captain did his duty. He was badly frozen and came very close to dying. He showed us all a noble example. We all loved Captain Willie, Mary Hearn wrote further. He was kind and considerate and did all that he could for the comfort of those in his company. And as I've told you before, in the end, 74 people in the Willie Company perished and many more would have if not for that heroic ride of Captain Willie. And yet, it's Captain Willie, among others, who strongly urged the saints to have faith and leave the Missouri and go on across the trail towards Salt Lake, notwithstanding the risk. It's Captain Willie who insulted and challenged Levi Savage. James G. Willie and, and the others were, the, were, in were in large part responsible that the people were out there in the first place. I am grateful that history has deservedly judged James G. Willie a hero, for surely he was. Notwithstanding what some may judge to be his mistakes, who is to say that these people were not chosen, blessed, and consecrated for the ordeal they endured in Wyoming? I don't know. My friends, with the atonement of Jesus Christ, our seeming mistakes need not judge us. They need not define us. With the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness. We can become something greater. And if the Savior does not define us by our mistakes, then why should we judge each other the same? Next story. This story took place years ago when my children were young and still at home. And today I was sitting in church thinking about it and it just came back to me. It had been one of those days around the house when everyone got up on the wrong side of the bed, grouchy and grumpy and snapping and biting like a cage of sharks. That's how the day started. And I have to admit, I was no better than anybody else. I was right in there, you know, heating things up too. Two of my daughters actually got into a heated argument over who got to read the new Harry Potter book first. The older one grabbed the book from the other, whereupon the younger one grabbed the book, kicked her in the shins and ran off. That was our day. Huh. Well, that, the two of them managed to work it out, but it, it bothered me. It really bothered me. I went off to work, teaching seminary that day, and I kept thinking about it. What is all this arguing and fighting going to do to my family? I decided I wanted to say something. I wanted to teach them, but what could I say that wouldn't come across like the endless, tedious drone of a nagging parent? You should do this, and you should do that, yada, 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 yada. I already knew that that was going to be about just about as effective with my children as a kiss through a screen door. So I had to come up with something better. I opened up the scriptures. I read the words of the Savior. For verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil who is the father of contention. And he stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another. You should be offended about that. They have no right to do that. You should stand up here. Da, 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 da. I read the verse, and just as I'd expected, 
my children that night knew exactly what the verse meant. They knew perfectly well that fighting and arguing were wrong. I also knew that once I finished talking, they were going to remember it just about as long as we remember every billboard or every uh, uh, mile post along the side of the highway, meaning not at all. Somehow I had to find a way to turn this message of contention in the family into a, into a message they would never forget. And then all of a sudden, just, just an idea just popped into my head. I'd never seen it. I'd never heard of it. Just an idea popped into my head. I gathered my family around the kitchen table. I talked about it. And then I took a, fo a photograph of our family and I set it on the table. And all the children were all gathered around looking at that photograph. And I took an eyedropper with Clorox bleach. And, I, and, and then without telling them what this was in the eyedropper, I took the dropper and I put a drop of bleach on my oldest daughter, the one that had been fighting that morning. I then dropped another drop on another family member. And I said, now let's just see what fighting and arguing, bickering, contention, and judging does to our family. And with that, I dropped drops on all the members of the family. Now, I didn't know what was gonna happen because I'd never done this before. And as we all stood around looking down at the photograph, all of a sudden, right before our very eyes, the image of my oldest daughter disappeared. And then another, and then another, until the entire family was gone. At that point, I looked up at my children and I said, now, what did contention just do to our family? I can still see in my mind's eye the stunned, awestruck look on my oldest daughter's face as she looked up at me and she said, it dissolved it. And so it does. It may seem harmless bickering, and fighting and quarreling in a family. Normal? Yes. Harmless? No. Contention is never worth it. It tears the family apart. Our families are our joy, our best friends, not only here, but hereafter. And as for me, and I still hold to this, God could put me in the most heavenly heaven, the most beautiful mountains, the greenest pastures. He could put me anywhere he wants and call it heaven and paradise. But if my family is not there, it's still hell. It may take many reminders to your family and mine just how deadly contention can be but I tell you, it's worth it. It is worth it to do all we can to keep our families close into old age as each other's best friends. Next story. Growing up the way I did and where I did in the Lemhi Valley of Idaho, I met individuals that came and went through the ranch some of them were pretty rough characters. For most of those old cowboys and farmers, children were often better seen than heard, and that children were often just in the way. One day I went to work with my dad down on the home place. Now, I don't remember that day what we were doing, but there was another hand there working with my dad, working with us that day. Of all of the cowboys that came and went, I still remember this guy. Why? Because he spoke to me, a mere boy, in a very unusual way. As we worked together, he didn't talk to me like I was a boy. 
meaning he didn't talk down to me. He spoke to me with kindness and respect, like I was an equal. It was as though he really believed that in spite of the fact that he was much older than I was, that he was no better than me. After that night, I never saw him again. I think he moved on. But I remember what an impact that cowboy had on me. He was an inspiration that came back to me many, many, many times in the years that followed. He had a profound influence on the way I treated my own children with reason, respect, and kindness. It, it took a long time, but I tried. Now, some time ago, I came across a story in a church magazine that amplified this point further. It seems that there was a Sunday school class full of little children, and some visitors came in one day. Some very important church leaders came in. The teacher bent down and asked a question of a little girl on the front row. How many important people are here today? The child stood up and began counting. One, two, three, reaching a total of 17. There were 17 people in the class. There were 17 very important people there that day, visitors and children. And so it is with our Almighty Father. Age, race, accomplishment, education, gender, color, doesn't matter. All are alike unto God, loved and respected. May it be so with us. Now let's take a break for a second. I hope you are well. I pray for you. Coming up this July, Dennis Lyman and myself are taking a group of people on what's called the Great American West and the Cowboy Tour. I've mentioned it before. I want to mention it again. I don't know that if the, the details have actually been put up on the website yet, but keep an eye out for historyofthesaints.org. If you're interested in this tour, send me a message or put it something in the comments. If you're interested in going on this Old West Cowboy Tour in July, it'll be about an eight-day tour. Reach out and let me know. If, like me, you've ever had a fascination for the great American cowboy and the American West, this would be the tour for you. It's not a religious tour. It's an Old West history tour. And also, in June and again in September, Dennis and I are going to take people out on to the Pioneer Trail, all the way from Parley Street to Salt Lake City, going both ways and buses along the trail. You'll get to stand in the ruts where your Pioneer ancestors traveled through, see the sites out on the high plains of Wyoming that were landmarks to them. Pilot Butte, Independence Rock, Scott's Bluff. We're going to go to all of them. And all the way along that trail, Dennis and I are going to tell you stories and keep you laughing. If you want to come, go to historyofthesaints.org. Check it out. I'd love to have you. Next story. Men are that they might have joy. Our Heavenly Father gave us life that we might learn to find joy. And all that he does is, is to lead us to the discovery and life in that joy. It is, it's our consummate purpose in life and eternity. Ironically, now, it's, it's in the obtaining of joy where saints and sinners looking for joy, where they go so radically apart. While a sinner will seek joy for himself by helping himself, indulging himself, and providing comfort, ease, security, and all that he needs, the saints find their joy 
by bringing it to the lives of others. Jesus was walking by and saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. Matthew, as you know, was a tax collector, a publican, one of the most hated and despised of all men among the Jews. Now, as in Matthew's case, as I mentioned earlier, publicans usually were Jews that worked for Rome brokering taxes, and oftentimes they were dishonest. And as such, they were detested as traitors and parasites living off the lifeblood of their own people. And when the Savior walked past Matthew, he said to this very unlikely candidate, follow me, Matthew 9, 9. Matthew was, however, a man devout, a student of the scriptures. Matthew rose and followed the Savior right there. That evening, Matthew hosted a celebratory dinner at his home and invited the master to attend. With his disciples and friends, Jesus feasted with Matthew and all of those who came to visit. The Pharisees came by, looked in, and in haughty, self-righteous condemnation, looked upon the happy crowd and scorned Jesus. Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners, they said to his disciples. Now, what were these Pharisees really saying? That someone of Jesus' stature shouldn't keep company was such an inferior lot of men as tax collectors and sinners. He was, as they considered themselves, too good for such rabble. Now, think about it. An attitude like that is based on hate and fear. Fear of men. It's not based on love, faith, and inclusion. Perfect love, after all, casteth out fear especially fear of other men. It is when we are insecure in our faith and our position, our beliefs, that we fear other men, what they may do to us in our position, and we judge, shun, and condemn them. Jesus overheard that statement, that condemning statement, and he said, they that behold need not a position, but they that are sick. Meaning, if the Pharisees considered themselves whole and healthy spiritually, then they didn't need him and he couldn't help them. The publicans and the sinners, on the other hand, they knew they were spiritually sick. They knew they needed help, and they came to Jesus to receive it. They were, therefore, in, more, in reality, more healthy spiritually before God than all the Pharisees were. I suppose it's still true. If we are confident that we are very righteous before God, we're probably worse off than the man who knows he's a sinner, doesn't come to church, and is out there begging and pleading for help and forgiveness. Jesus recognized in that setting that his metaphor probably went past them, the thing about the physician. And he said to them, go ye and learn what that meaneth. And then he added, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am come, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. When he said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, that translates into saying, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It is as though Jesus was saying to those Pharisees, I want all of you Stop it. Have compassion, mercy, forgiveness. Do not sacrifice your fellows to your harsh judgments and opinions. Welcome all men into your company and love them as I love you. Be like me to help them. When Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Did he ever say or even imply, except you, or you, or you because of this? In turning, in turning others away from us, we turn God away from us. 
in hoarding our happiness, we lose it. Our joy in this life will be just as great as we labor to bring it to others. This story I'm about to share with you came out in the Ensign years ago. I never forgot it, and I don't know that I've ever shared it in this context. The Savior said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. That's not a new commandment, not even in Jesus' day. But the rest of it is, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Love as I love. He said. But sometimes people are hard to love. It's not socially popular to love certain people. I know I'm guilty of that too often. This story is about a 17-year-old high school senior by the name of Ronnie. Ronnie wasn't just shy. Ronnie was downright backward and awkward. He had no friends, and it showed. Wherever Ronnie went, he walked with drooped shoulders, staring at his feet as though trying to hide his face. He always sat in the back, and he never spoke. Thus, when Ronnie began coming to Sunday school, it astonished everyone, especially the teacher. Soon, however, it was discovered why Ronnie was coming to Sunday school. There was a, a young man in that same class named Brandon Craig. Brandon had befriended Ronnie and asked him to come. It was painful for Ronnie to be there, but Brandon stuck to him like glue, protecting him, helping him, shepherding him along. Theirs was what was described as a classic mismatch of friendship. For all that Ronnie was not, socially and emotionally, Brandon was. Brandon stuck to Ronnie like glue and protected him. Brandon was the number one athlete in the school, well-liked, successful at everything he did, and he stood a full head taller than Ronnie. Now in the class, of course, no one wanted to scare Ronnie away even the teacher played a low profile and walked carefully. But then to one, one day, to everyone's surprise, Brian, the class president, called on Ronnie to pray. Slowly, Ronnie made his way to the front of the room, still looking at his shoes. Can you imagine the feeling in that room. While the class waited in frozen suspense, there came forth a voice just barely above a whisper. Our Father in heaven, thank you for our Sunday school class. And then silence, long, loud, uncomfortable silence. And then sniffles and finally a muffled sob. Opening his eyes, the teacher started to the front of the room. But Brandon got there first, bending his six foot four frame down. Brandon put his chin on Ronnie's shoulder and began to the whisper and began to whisper the words of a short, sweet prayer in Ronnie's ear. Ronnie struggled to regain his composure as he repeated the words of the prayer. And when it was over, Ronnie kept his head bowed and added, Thank you for Brandon. Amen. And then turning to look up at his big friend, Ronnie said loud enough for everyone in the room to hear, I love you, Brandon. I love you too, Ronnie. I want to be like Brandon. I have a long ways to go, but I want to be like Brandon. This last story came because I read it in the scriptures this morning, and I can't get it off my mind. How does God really feel about us? 
I mean, after all, look at us. Compared to him, we're weak, fallen, forgetful, prone to make mistakes, prone to be cruel. Look at what we are compared to him. We are, even the best of us, we are unworthy. There are many stories about God's love for us, but there's one in particular that strikes a resonating chord with me. It was early in the morning during the Feast of the Tabernacles. The Savior came into the temple to teach, probably into the court of the women. A small crowd gathered to listen to him, and suddenly they were interrupted by a commotion. A group of men, scribes and Pharisees, approached the Savior, dragging a woman in obvious distress. They placed her in the midst of the people. And with a certain arrogance declared before Jesus, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? It was a trap. This they said to tempt Jesus. It was an ugly, ill-conceived trap with no regard for victims. Why? Because if Jesus said, stone her, well, he would immediately incur the wrath of the Romans who forbade Jewish capital punishment. But if he said, on the other hand, release her, let her go, forgive, let her go, then they would catch that up and, and, and say that he was contradicting Moses the revered lawgiver of Israel. So no matter which way he answered, he was going to be in trouble. The accusations, moreover, that they were leveling against this woman were illegal and insensitive, so cruel. They had no right nor authority under Moses' law to do as they did. But in their mind, they don't care about her. All they care about is getting him. And in their mind, they have him. There's no way for him to get out of this one. For a moment, just step back and look down on the scene. Consider that woman. There's evidently no doubt nor conjecture what she's done, caught in the very act. But does she deserve this? I can imagine her already broken in spirit, disheveled and weeping, embarrassed at public humiliation she is forced to endure at the hands of evil men. Well, to the surprise of these heartless men, Jesus didn't answer. He simply stooped down and began writing on the ground as though he didn't hear them. And in so doing, all the attention came on to him. They continued to press him for an answer. And finally, at their pressing, he raised himself up and said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. John 8, 7. In this context, he that is without sin perhaps even that same sin? If, you don't, if you're not guilty of that sin, go ahead, throw a stone at her. No one moved. In, in, for me, before I look at someone else and condemn them, now it's impossible not to notice when people are different or when people are not living the way they should. It's impossible not to notice it, but we don't have to condemn we don't have to judge. We don't have to shun or withdraw or otherwise gossip or besmirch them. We can notice. But we don't have to judge and condemn. And he is saying here, until you've perfected all of your mistakes, don't condemn others for theirs. And with saying that, Jesus stooped down and began writing again on the ground. And the scripture records that they went out 
one by one, from the oldest to the youngest. And finally, Jesus raised himself up and looked about and addressed the woman. Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And I love this. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He knew what she had done was wrong, but he didn't withdraw his love. He didn't judge and condemn and send her away in shame. He loved her, and he let her know that. And because of that, the scripture records that the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on his name. It is a principle of highest priority to know for ourselves that God loves us and doesn't condemn us. Each day we make mistakes. He still doesn't condemn us. He reaches out and draws us in. No matter how evil we've been, he draws us in and gives us the opportunity to change. It is not until this life is over when they are sent off to the buffetings of Satan, and then it's too late. Why should we send others to hell now when he doesn't? I promise you that no matter what you've done, he still loves you and will not condemn you. Repentance is still there. And the Savior will still welcome you with open arms. And I promise you as well, mercy and compassion for others begets it for yourself. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Jesus declared. Why can't we say the same thing? Come to me. I'm your friend. I'll always be your friend. That's it for tonight. Now, this next part's very hard. Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, I'm going to do a short broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. Some of you have had many questions about why I'm living in this bunkhouse, why I'm a nomad living on the road, going from place to place. I don't like to talk about my personal life, but it's time that I do. So tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, I will try to answer the questions as best I can, short and sweet and to the point. For now, My dear and beloved friends, good night and God bless.